Now it's my, my real pleasure to introduce our second uh, speaker um, for today to you. Uh, so welcome, Professor Daniela Krause. Um, Professor Daniela Krause is a specialist in laboratory and transfusion medicine. And I hope I have everything right because this is really, really recent information as she has just recently taken over the position or a new position as director of the Institute of Transfusion Medicine at the University of Mainz in Germany, and also holds the newly established professorship for transfusion medicine at the University of Mainz. So please correct me if this is, <laughs> is not correct. And before moving to Mainz, uh, Daniela uh, was a research group leader at the Georg Speyer House. This is the Institute for Tumor and Biology and Experimental Therapy in Frankfurt in Germany. And since 2015, she had been a professor of cell and gene therapy at the Faculty of Medicine of the Goethe University in Frankfurt. And she has also co-chaired the John Gottman Conference of CML together with Jorge Cortes and Timothy Hughes. And we're really happy to have you here and to hear from you about your highlights, your biological highlights from the meeting. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Stephanie. And hello to everyone, uh, to everywhere, wherever you are. Um, it's a real pleasure to be here once again to uh, tell you a little bit about the highlights of the CML meeting that took place in the south of France. And <clears throat> I'd like to tell you that uh, once again, it's been a terrific meeting full of new insight into the biology of CML. You know, some people think we know everything in CML, but we actually don't. And it's really a, a pleasure to see every year how much more um, data is coming out of the different laboratories all over the world. And <clears throat> I'd like to start with um, a couple of highlights, um, and I've sort of divided them into different topics. And the first topic is new therapies. And one of them um, that came from David Vetri's group in Glasgow in, in Scotland is the use of a uh, selective serotonin release inhibitor, which is actually used for depression. Um, and uh, this was used in for the treatment of CML. And this was first um, developed showing that there's a certain uh, protein that is more highly expressed in the leukemic stem cells in chronic myeloid leukemia and followed by studies that if you delete this gene, uh, for instance, in mice or in cells, you can actually get a, a decrease of the progression of a CML disease. And then the group also combine the use of this drug, it's called peroxetine, uh, together with a tyrosine kinase inhibitor, in this case it was nilotinib, and they really showed in um, mouse models that this reduced the tumor burden uh, of CML, and further they showed that a certain pathway called the CMIC pathway, which has previously been shown to play an important role in CML, uh, was, was affected. So that was really quite um, exciting. The other piece of information that we heard was from Mike Danninger's lab. Um, he is now in Milwaukee, uh, and they developed a completely new drug that um, has a very different mechanism. So as you know, tyrosine kinase inhibitors sort of attach to the target, uh, bisurabel, and they inhibit the, at least in the case of imatinib or nilotinib, they inhibit the phosphorylation of the downstream signaling targets. And what this drug does, it uses nilotinib as what they call the warhead, and it's coupled to a couple of chemical compounds that leads to the degradation of its target protein uh, once it binds. So imagine you have a nilotinib that binds to uh, bisurabel, and it then degrades bisurabel. So as we think, or well, we know that bisurabel is the driving force be be behind CML. So if you degrade uh, bisurabel, you don't get disease. And this was, I think, very, very exciting data. This uh, technology is called Protax. It's a new kind of drug. And um, some of these agents in other cancers are already in, cl in clinical, early clinical trials. And <clears throat> we hope that, um, this drug uh, will be making it into the clinic at some point as well. So this is very, very exciting. Um, and then uh, a new uh, antibody treatment was uh, shown by um, uh, Ravi Majetti from San Francisco. And basically, Ravi made his uh, story uh, based on an antibody against a molecule called CD47, which, is, uh, which sits on the surface of acute myeloid leukemia cells. And this um, 
antibody, if you have, if you use it therapeutically, blocks CD47 on um, these AML cells, and basically it says to the macrophages and all the immune cells that will eat up the malignant cells, don't eat me. Um, and so basically, if you if you block that signal, all the cells will be eaten and destroyed. And what Ravi did, they developed a new antibody against CD93, so a different target, which seems to be expressed uh, specifically in CML. And uh, once again, it is to be hoped that this antibody will also make it into the clinic and hopefully be just as successful as CD47. Um, the next topic I'd like to tell you something about is um, the microenvironment. And in particular, in, in CML and the leukemias, we talk about the bone marrow and the bone marrow microenvironment as the site of the tumor. Uh, so this is where CML usually develops. It's where the therapies act. Um, and there's lots of uh, biology, biological studies going on to understand the microenvironment. <clears throat> and one such... Uh, Abstract came from uh, Vigna Helgeson's lab, also in Glasgow. And basically, uh, Vigna's group showed that the macrophages, so this is a type of immune cell that will eat up the malignant cells, um, actually change their function and their gene expression based on the fact that CML is basically all around in the bone marrow. And <clears throat> with this study, uh, they hope to eventually develop therapies that also target these macrophages in order to contain the, the CML. Uh, from our laboratory, actually, we, had, uh, we showed a story that even the calcium ions in the bone marrow, um, so of course the, uh, the bone marrow is within the bone and the bone consists of calcium ions. So even those calcium ions have a very important effect on the leukemia. And that is because the leukemia cells express the so-called calcium sensing receptor that distinguishes um, or can measure the concentration of calcium outside of the cells. And very interestingly, we found that this calcium sensing receptor plays a very differential role in b positive CML versus AML due to the MLLAF9 or MN1 uh, oncogene. Uh, so very exciting. We also showed uh, that a certain drug, um, <clears throat> NPS2143, might be very beneficial in AML and um, in CML, we um, also suggested that combination with uh, such a drug might be beneficial um, in the treatment of CML, but this is very preclinical at this stage. Um, <clears throat> other um, neuron models, uh, also this is work from Glasgow, uh, showed that certain cytokines um, in the bone marrow uh, really improve the engraftment of the leukemia cells in the in the bone marrow. This was also in a mouse model, but it provides us with a tool of how to study CML better if we have improved mouse models. And so that is very important uh, to know uh, what factors are actually playing a role for the survival of the leukemic stem cells in CML. And um, lastly, another um, uh, abstract was about CXCL14, which is a chemokine, which also was shown to decrease the leukemic stem cells in chronic myeloid leukemia, and that in combination with imatinib, um, it had a very beneficial effect. Um, uh, Jorge has already told you a lot about uh, the concept of a treatment-free remission and some of the new findings. Um, I also wanted to tell you about uh, Susan Bramford's data, uh, basically that clonal hemotopoiesis might actually be used as a prognostic factor in uh, treatment-free remission. And I think that's the new um, understanding. And um, Jorge explained to you the concept of clonal hematopoiesis. There are also other biomarkers uh, that were shown to influence outcome uh, with respect to treatment-free remission. Some of them is expression of GATA1, which is a transcription factor. Then the uh, state of the natural killer cells um, the degree of inflammation in the hematopoietic stem and progenitor cells, um, and the hierarchical skewing. So this is, if you think about hematopoiesis as a hierarchy, so depending on how this hierarchy might be skewed, uh, let's say before you withdraw treatment in a patient on a tyrosine kinase inhibitor, might provide some uh, prognosis as to who might uh, go into treatment for remission and who might not. 
Um, other studies you know, reported again about the concept of the duration of MR4 to be very predictive of TFR. Then um, high levels of um, another protein called BCLXL, for example, might be a predictor of treatment failure. This is an a apoptosis marker, and um, that might be associated with treatment failure. And then also um, the natural killer cells or NK cells and certain receptors on their surface um, have quite a strong association with treatment-free remission um, as the new findings. With regards to the concept of leukemic stem cells, um, a, it was shown that another protein uh, called SETD2 has a very specific role on the uh, genetic stability of, um, of b able, for example, and uh, within the cells. And other markers like CD26, CD35, clearly seem to separate between the normal hematopoietic stem cell and the leukemic stem cells. And it's actually this ratio between leukemic stem cells and normal uh, HSCs that seem to be linked to therapy response. So all of this is important, for instance, if you want to um, <clears throat> isolate the normal stem cells versus the malignant stem cells and then compare their um, gene expression profile, for example. So these are providing us with very, very important tools to eventually uh, improve therapies. Um, <clears throat> there were very good talks also about metabolism. Um, and the Irings group uh, showed, for example, that lipid metabolism, so you know, um, not just the body has lipid or lipid metabolism, but also every individual cell has its own metabolism, of course. And here, even the lipid metabolism seems to be playing a role and <clears throat> thereby also plays a role in resistance to tyrosine kinase inhibitor. Um, another <clears throat> concept um, also showed us that amino acid met metabolism um, and also might be playing a role in TKA resistance and certain drugs targeting um, the metabolism called ox ox oxidative phosphorylation um, might also be very important. We had a very, very interesting symposium uh, where different concepts were uh, combined. And uh, one of the topics there showed actually that in hematopoietic stem cell transplantation, the age of the donor actually matters uh, uh, quite a bit in, uh, in stem cell transplantation, but not really by the degree of clonal hematopoiesis this donor might have, but really by the increased autoimmune response and by the more the higher inflammation that is usually present in an uh, elderly person compared to a younger person. And also, if you take an older uh, donor, usually there's more graft versus host disease upon uh, transplantation. Um, in this um, symposium, there was also a lecture on myeloproliferative neoplasia, which is basically a group of diseases to which CML belongs. And it was shown here that also the neutrophils in this these are the cell types that usually in a healthy situation eat up the bacteria, that they are playing a very important role in myeloproliferative neoplasia um, and that this defective clearance of these uh, neutrophils actually plays an important role in myeloproliferative neoplasia. Um, we had invited quite a few speakers from outside the field of CML um, and some of these speakers uh, were very or are very, very well known in their respective fields. And it was exciting to see how they sort of have a different view of uh, cancer, for example, or CMO in particular. One of these talks was by uh, Ivan Dikic, who is an um, excellent scientist uh, in Frankfurt. And he talked to us about autophagy and cancer. So autophagy is basically a mechanism that a cell employs in order to eat up um, its own components when it's being stressed. For instance, when it's being exposed to chemotherapy or a tyrosine kinase inhibitor. And uh, Ivan's group uh, showed um, that certain proteins are called FAM134B, for example. These are proteins that eat up the machinery that prote pr produces proteins uh, in a cell and that these, um, Pro, um, genes can often be mutated in several cancers, uh, for instance, pancreatic cancer. And he also alluded to the very long history of autophagy inhibitors in, in CML, um, which once 
at some point might uh, find their way into the clinic. They haven't quite yet. They are in, some have been in clinical trials, but we might be going back to that. Um, Ravi Bhatia gave us an excellent talk about leukemic stem cells, uh, showing that a certain population of leukemic stem cells might be associated with a more inflammatory signature and altered metabolism. And then we had a fascinating talk by Lucy Godley from Chicago, who is extremely well known for really identifying this entity of hereditary leukemia, my, hereditary myelodysplastic syndrome and leukemia. And she uh, went into the different genes that have been found in families where a leukemia has been hereditary. Some of them are called SAM, SAM D9, GATA2, uh, DDX41, just to name a few. And um, it has been shown that these mutations in some cases actually also create an inflammatory uh, situation in the patient who then might go on to develop myelodysplastic syndrome or leukemia. Another lecture talked about the role of uh, P53, which is, a, uh, is considered a tumor suppressor, which is frequently deleted in some cancers. Um, then we had a lecture by Halvard Bönig from also from Frankfurt, who is an expert on cell therapy. So in, in the old days, when we did a lot of transplantation for uh, CML, uh, hematopoietic stem cell transplantation for CML, some of these patients developed terrible graft versus host disease. And Halvard and his group have developed a new cellular therapy using mesenchymal stroma cells. So these are cells, stroma cells from the bone marrow that they isolate and basically expand. And then you can reinfuse these mesenchymal stroma cells off the shelf into a patient. And they've done several trials on this, particularly in children with graft host disease with really very encouraging results. Um, and then lastly, we had two extremely exciting workshops, uh, first of all, on imaging. So these are, you know, very sophisticated imaging and microscopy um, projects where um, the researchers are able to look into the bone marrow um, of mice at the beginning, but increasingly also on uh, trephine biopsies of patients with leukemias or also. And in the first talk by Daniel Lucas, um, it was actually shown that they had developed a very defined map of the bone marrow and its different cellular constituents. So he was able to show that there are really quite specific locations of different hematopoietic cells within the bone marrow. Uh, for instance, the erythroid cells are closer to the sinusoids the lymphoid cells are closer to the arteries. And he also showed that actually, if you think that the sternum, the bone in this, the sternum is the same as the hip bone, well, actually it's not. These bones differ actually quite considerably. So we need to keep that in mind also when we do trephine uh, biopsies. Um, then uh, Christina Lucelso from London uh, showed us some time-lapse imaging of hematopoietic stem cells. So basically you, take a microscope and look at hematopoietic stem cells in the calvarium, so in the very thin bone on the top of the head of a mouse where you also have bone marrow, and you can track the hematopoietic, hematopoietic stem cells, see where they go, see where they linger, who do they attach to. And um, <clears throat> uh, Chris, Christina actually showed that this migration speed of these hematopoietic stem cells seemed to correlate with the differentiation state. Uh, she also extended her work to the setting of leukemia and also looked at macrophages in the Bowman microenvironment with these very sophisticated imaging technologies. And then uh, lastly, uh, Cesar Nombela Norieta from Zurich uh, was look also made a map of the bone marrow, but this time not looking at the hematopoietic cells, but looking at the stroma cells. And actually, they're very, very tightly defined stromal cell networks in the bone marrow where the cells talk to each other. And it was shown that they are more ad adipocytic stroma cells. So these are, these are the cells that make the fat cells in the bone marrow. And there are um, more inflammatory uh, cells like that. Um, so that was a very exciting workshop. And then the next day we had a workshop on single cell analysis. So single cell analysis is a very modern technology 
by which you can look at the gene expression in single cells. For instance, you take a lymph node of a patient with a lymphoma and you uh, subject it to single cell analysis. And so you can clearly identify the signature of each individual cell um, and basically group them together and say, this is the malignant cell. It has a very uh, pro-inflammatory signature. This is the non-malignant cell. And it's a very um, exciting technology. And this was used by uh, Christina Kirchner from Gasco to look at the senescence um, in uh, normal stem cells and in mesenchymal stroma cells. It was used to, you can also do single cell analysis for protein. Um, and this was also shown, so basically single cell proteomics, and you can uh, specifically look at different signaling proteins after initiation of a tyrosine kinase inhibitor, for example. Um, and, uh, and lastly, the last talk was about single cell analysis of the cancer cells in colon cancer. So basically, these workshops are meant to portray very exciting new technologies, and then every researcher can go home and basically look at um, how he or she might uh, use these technologies for their own research. So that was really the highlights of the biological um, abstracts. And um, that was it from my side. And I'm also very happy to take questions. Thank you so much, Daniela, um, for this really, really interesting summary from, from your perspective. Um, I, I'd really like to take a bit of time, we're running out of time, but to take a time for a Q&A session and to bring, in, especially to bring in both perspectives, the clinical and the biological one, uh, together. So, um, yeah, we, we open the floor to your questions. Um, so far, I haven't seen, yeah, there is one question. <laughs> um, so there is one question to Jorge, to the clinical part. What are your advice and recommendations for the second or third attempt of TFR? So um, it, it depends on, on why the first attempt uh, was not successful. Uh, but in general, what I would say is that if I'm going to try a second time, I want to uh, re make sure that it is an MR 4.5 and perhaps go for a longer duration. So let's say that I did it after two years of MR 4.5. I would want to see more time. We've already, there's been some data we published on that some, some years ago, and little by little, there's been some um, others that support that, that uh, the longer duration of MR4.5 uh, decreases the risk of relapse. So that, that would be perhaps the, the one approach that I would consider um, uh, as, as perhaps uh, important to, to do that. Um, and then there's a second part of that question that says that you usually consider um, TKI dose reduction in patients with an MMR or deep molecular <laughs> response. Um, and, um, you, you know, more and more we've been doing dose reductions many times because of toxicity, um, but sometimes uh, intentionally. And there is one study uh, that's called the DESTINY study where, where it, patients were intentionally dose reduced before attempting TFR. Uh, and that seemed to, um, uh, reduce the risk of uh, of withdrawal syndrome and and these uh, the, these other problems, uh, not uh, adversely affecting the probability of uh, maintaining the the remission after treatment discontinuation. So I think that in some instances that's a valid point. Now some patients are not able to discontinue therapy or not interested in discontinuing therapy, and yet you can lower the dose and, and decrease the, the risk of adverse events. And then the last part of that question is about dose reduction in MMR or DMR for T359 positive patients with uh, a CIMINI. I think there's very little information on that. So I, um, I would be cautious in doing it regularly if there is an indication for those reduction, um, I think that that's, that certainly should be considered if there's side effects or so on. Um, but uh, although I think that it is possible that it may work, we need to remember that the IC50 for T315i uh, with a CIMINIV is higher than for the unmutated 
uh, BCR able. So um, I, I think that um, it, 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 if it's going to be attempted, it has to be done very cautiously. Fantastic. Thank you for, for answering these questions. Are there any other questions from the audience um, so far? I think there's one question in yeah. the comments for Daniela. Uh, I read it out to everyone. Will analyzing CD34 and CD38 and CD26, and I hope I get it right, population at the time of diagnosis help us to identify better candidates for TFR? a deep response. Yes, thank you for the question. I think it's a good thought. Um, I'm not sure that would be, that would just suffice uh, whether CD26 is sufficient. Um, as, as you heard, for instance, CD93 is another marker. So I think we are not quite sure yet, um, you know, what the markers may be. There are so many factors that are playing a role. Um, I mentioned the NK cells, we mentioned the uh, clonal hematopoiesis, we mentioned um, certain other uh, proteins like uh, BCL, XL. It is, I think it is still a little bit too early uh, to say what exactly it will be. Um, and I doubt it's going to be just one population or one set of cells. It will probably be more. And um, I think the word is still out there. And perhaps um, Jorge can, can add as to what is done clinically so far, uh, if anything, to predict who might benefit from from withdrawal of treatment? I, you know, that, that, that's a very uh, important question, but I don't think we have a, an answer. And I don't think we have, it, it's very difficult. You know, at that point, these residual cells are, are very, very few. So, so finding them to, in a clinical uh, laboratory is, is very difficult. So I think that uh, for the moment, that remains a, as a research tool. So we, we spoke about some of the biomarkers that have been uh, identified. Um, and those are attractive, but you know we, we need to understand that these are also still investigational. Okay, thank you. Any any more question? I think there is a raised hand from Professor Malhotra from India. So please feel free to um, switch on your camera and speak up. Um, hi, uh, hi everybody. Really uh, nice listening to Dr. Cortez and uh, Daniela. I have a question to Dr. Cortez. Uh, can you hear me? I can. Very good. How are you? Uh, I'm very good, sir. We're waiting for you to come to Mumbai. I'll be there soon. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so my question to you, Dr. Cortez, is that for the really high-risk patient of CMLA diagnosis, uh, say, for example, somebody who has accelerated phase or one of the really bad mutations, say, for example, ASXL mutations, uh, would this patient be a candidate for a combination of uh, acimenib with one of the first generation or the second generation TKIs? Are there any indications that uh, uh, this would help? Um, the, 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 those patients are, are, are definitely patients that we are interested in improving what we have so far. We know that patients, for example, in accelerated phase at the time of diagnosis, they do definitely better with second generation TKS compared to imatinib. Uh, but the patients, for example, with uh, uh, ASXL1 mutation, um, that's, that's still an area where we don't know what's the right approach. Um, and the combination, would be attractive. However, based on the data that Andreas presented on the on this fascination study, I worry about the the, the side effects. Um, and and although we don't have a subset analysis from the Australian study, um, I think uh, you know it'll be interesting to see what asimilib alone can do if if that is enough to overcome that uh, adverse uh, uh, prognosis. So. Um, I think it will be premature to use a combination, uh, but certainly it's a population where we know we're going to need, uh, in general, more than just imatinib. Uh, we just don't know exactly what that will be uh, at the moment. Thank you very much. Uh, one question to Daniela. Uh, so, like, we have this new, uh, even more sensitive uh, PCR, the digital droplet PCR, you think if we do the deep molecular response assessment with the DDPCR, 
then we would be able to fine tune in selecting our patients for TFR a little better than the standard RQPCR? Well, I think once again, it's a difficult question and it uh, goes along with the previous question that was asked. Um, I think, you know, more sensitive, more sensitive techniques are always better. And one of the biomarkers that was shown was the duration of MR4. So yes, the better we can detect MR4 uh, with better technologies, the better. But as mentioned, there's so many other factors that are still influencing who will benefit or who will achieve TFR, like NK cells, like uh, chip, um, like BCS, BCLXL levels, for example. So I think it's it won't just be the methodology that will help us. Um, there are so many more factors where we also have to just get better uh, with the sensitivity of these assays. And we still need to understand them, I believe. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for joining. Fantastic. And um, so we're almost coming to a close now, but are there any other questions from the audience? Don't see any hands raised. So if not, just to come to a close, I'd like to ask you both, like looking more into the future, what are, from your perspective, the most like promising new research areas and what do you like to see captured in the next conference next year? Hmm. Like well, from, from my end, I, I think that, um, you know, I'm, I'm very interested to see what happens with all these studies with frontline assimilative. Um, I think that there is a real potential there to, to close further the gap on those patients who don't get to these deep molecular responses. And as uh, Professor Mahotra was uh, was uh, alluding to, whether that can help us on those patients with these um, uh, mutations in, in other cancer-related genes, that is an area, those those mutations where we, we still, we don't know what we need to do. We don't understand what's the best way to approach them. Uh, we need to work a lot uh, in, that, uh, in that area. So, um, I, I think that we are going to see uh, a lot more coming out in, in, the, in, in the next meetings on, on strategies to overcome these pro adverse prognoses, um, but also trying to you know, understand better how is it that it confers resistance, how, 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 does, how does it affect the outcome, uh, both positively and negatively, because that study from... from um, um, you know, the, the, on the chips in in uh, uh, in TFR is is really fascinating, but I don't think we understand why. Yeah, and I think as as for me, I I really hope to uh, include again next year these speakers from fields that are a little bit outside of the CML field because I think we have so much to learn from each other, um, and you know, somebody who talks about autophagy or linear ubiquitination and to rope these people in because it's going to help us sort of look outside the box a little bit in the setting of uh, the biology of CML and just think about other concepts. Um, and I also think that um, we need, you know, still more research on metabolism, uh, on uh, microenvironment, on the leukemic stem cell. And we still don't really know if you eradicate the le leukemic stem cell, have we really gotten rid of the CML-like disease? Do we need to get rid of the CML stem cells? I think these are questions that still need to be answered. And so, yes, we're not, we're not done yet and, and we need to continue um, in, all, in all ways. Yeah, and lots of, lots of research still going on, which is good yes. news. Yeah. Um, yeah, thank you so much. Um, we're now coming to a close and yeah, I'm already looking forward to your next summary of the next con uh, conference next year. But for now, we'd like to really thank you for your comprehensive summaries. And uh, a big thank you to all of you for joining us today and uh, for submitting all your questions um, that makes uh, our webinars um, interactive and, and more, even more valuable. Um, our next ICMF conversation will be held in January um, with uh, key highlights from the ESH annual meeting um, in December. The speakers and timing is not yet confirmed, are not yet confirmed, but uh, please watch out um, for news on our social media channels or on the ISMED website.